In this short video lecture today, I'm going to be talking about one of the people that Deborah Schultz, a historian at Kingsborough, uh, writes about in her book called Going South. Uh, that person's name is Ella Baker, one of the instrumental people in getting the civil rights movement going. Um, and we're going to be talking about her in relation to something called critical agency. You can kind of consider critical agency to mean something more like the ability to make change. Um, a lot of times I'll talk to students and one of the big things that they say is either things never change or how do I get started on making change. Um, so we wanted to provide a clearer idea of how that happens. So first I wanted to say a little bit about Deborah Schultz. Um, it's one of the my favorite parts about working at a community college in Brooklyn is the number of amazing people I get to work with, both the uh, students and faculty and staff um, at Kingsborough. And I actually met Professor Schultz um, during a project called the Brooklyn Public Scholars, which was a collection of about 20 or more professors who were looking at how we could think about instilling civic engagement in our classes uh, in a meaningful way. Um, something that was with students as opposed to doing something to students or teaching to students, but actually getting their insights on what we should be studying, what we should be looking at. And um, that's how we started talking to each other um, about the kind of work that we were doing and what we hoped to accomplish here at Kingsboro. Um, she teaches history at Kingsboro, so please check her out. Um, one of her classes is actually on the civil rights movement. Um, so you might look on CUNY first or go by the Department of History and uh, find out more about her. I'll also be conducting an interview with her this semester, um, which I'll share on the SoundCloud um, page as well as on my blog or you know teaching page that we'll talk about a little bit later in this presentation on CUNY Commons. <clears throat> so in a book that we wrote, uh, or sorry, that we both contributed to about civic engagement at Kingsboro, um, she wrote something that I, I was really impressed by. Um, so she said it's important to acknowledge and theorize from the highs and lows we experience as professors. We want so much from our students, and we understand the odds stacked against them. My insistence on teaching the civil rights movement stems from a desire to provide an example of another time not too far in our country's past when things seemed hopeless and yet a small group of citizens managed to transform our nation anyway. Um, I think there's two things that I'd, I'd kind of highlight from this. Um, the first was, I think a lot of times um, students might think about the world in a way that's probably healthy, um, you know, seeing kind of an idealism of what they can do, but also that same idealism can really be overwhelming. Um, and so when she said the odds are stacked against them, I really kind of remembered what it was like being a community college student, um, first in my family to go to college. And, you know, I did feel that way. It felt like just the little things were very difficult um, to get through, whether it was just buying books um, or having to work while I was in school. That didn't really always square with some of the things I was learning in class. Um, so I appreciate the fact that that this woman who is from Brooklyn um, really brought this to her classroom, that she understood that it's quite a bit to not only go to school but to graduate and to use that degree in a meaningful way. I also appreciated the way that she kind of highlighted the need to not just show the problems, um, but also to highlight how people in the past have been able to be successful in overcoming various obstacles. Um, since I've been teaching in 2010, we kind of hit this same roadblock as we go through the semester, and students wanted to see an example of change. So not just talking about what's gone wrong and what we could do, but also how did other people in the past get things accomplished? Um, and one of those ways of thinking, as you'll see the cartoons provided by a student, was instead of talking about or to students, um, we both believe in the dialogue with students so that we can study these problems together because we all have various specialties and previous knowledge that we bring into the classroom that we don't want to lose. So turning again to her book, um, Going South, where she highlights a group of individuals, um, specifically women of the Jewish heritage, 
um, who in the North saw what was going on in the civil rights movement and probably, and, and she writes about this a bit, but I don't want to overgeneralize, but a big overwhelming kind of feeling came over many young Jewish women that because of what had happened in Nazi Germany and in the Soviet Union, she felt uh, that she needed to highlight these stories of women who saw that as a reason to get involved in larger social justice issues. Now, how that plays itself out is uh, the subject of her book, and it's a great book. Um, you can look for it on Amazon. Um, it's, again, called Going, Going South by Deborah Schultz. One of the early characters in that book that she introduces is this dynamic woman named Ella Baker, who, you know, I didn't grow up with a lot of civil rights education. I'd heard about kind of the, the greatest hits, you might call them, uh, Malcolm X, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., um, in some ways, um, Rosa Parks, and Thurgood Marshall. But, uh, you know, I'd never heard about the people who really got the movement started. When we, when we hear about those other individuals, those tend to be idealized or romanticized towards the end of the movement. Um, Whereas Ella Baker, who was one of the principal leaders in the early movement with students, um, is quoted in, her, in De Deborah's book as saying, the civil rights movement needed the development of people who are not interested in being leaders. Um, oftentimes you'll hear in a classroom or even in other settings that we need more leaders. Um, but she really identified the need as really developing leadership among other people, or in other words, people like us, people like you. Um, and this came out of her frustration with the hierarchy. So the idea that only the elite, only the educated, only the uh, top of the top kind of people could, you know, make change. And so she challenged her students, uh, where do we go from here? And that really puts the position of power in the student's point of view, right? What do you, what can you contribute? What do you know? Um, what do you want to deal with? As opposed to always kind of looking for some external um, person to help us. Another character um, is Dottie Miller, um, or Dottie Zellner Miller. And, you know, I, th I thought this was an interesting passage you can find in pages 31 to 35. Um, Ella Baker, who was 54 at the time, and, and Dottie was a young woman, um, was known respectfully as Miss Baker. And I guess one of the qualities that you can see coming out with uh, Ella Baker is her foresight, her ability to see not what's needed at the exact moment, but what's going to be needed 5, 10, 20 years down the road? And so through a lot of effort, she secured an office space, which was small, dirty, and chaotic, but you know it was just enough to keep the movement going. And then at a kind of different moment in that story, Dottie Zellner had been asked whether she could type. Now, she was asked this by an older man, and so she kind of had a knee-jerk reaction, which was probably accurate. Um, that, you know, why is this man asking me this? Is this all he thinks that I can do? But I, I really appreciate her courage in this moment and her capacity to think clearly about her role. And she said, not only can I type, I can write too. This showed that she really wanted to offer more than just maybe what she had learned right in the past. Like uh, oftentimes we think, well, you know, I'm not um, a specialist in this area, so you know, I, I can't do that. Or I've only learned how to do this task, so I can only do this. She wanted to see it as much broader. Um, what are the skills and talents that I have and how can I put them to use regardless of what my official credentials are, what my degree says? And through that, a student voice, right? This is what the publication was called, was born, right? Out of this question that whether she could type. Um, and now you can see that the, the man was likely just trying to figure out um, how could they get some kind of process that documented the experience of the civil rights movement going and who, who could really contribute to that. So it wasn't so much it was her idea to get this publication going, but she was obviously necessary and essential uh, to getting it off the ground. Now, Deborah writes about the fact that this is one of the only uh, pieces of news um, amidst kind of all the different news corporations and small newspapers that reported violence against African Americans and women in the South. So not only is it kind of a new thing coming from students, it also turns out to be a very important historical narrative of what was actually going on and, you know, kind of a ground level uh, point of view that showed what was happening in the streets, um, in people's homes and et cetera. 
And Dottie and Deborah both kind of highlight this idea that it was really Ella Baker's group leadership mental model, right? Her idea that we don't need one person leading us. In fact, we need to all be leaders and we need to contribute in the way that we can and exercise our agency, our ability to make change. And so she says, Dottie says, that this helped non-African Americans come to know their own identity in the movement, which was central, you know, a lot about racial violence. And so this allowed for other people to become allies and agents for social change because they got to develop their own identities and their own form of agency. They got to contribute in the way that was meaningful to them. So I think about this uh, along with one of my um, colleagues and uh, co-authors at Kingsborough, Helen Margaret Nasser. Um, we think about this as a framework or a way of thinking about critical agency. So if you look at the kind of you are here, this is the baseline, right? So what are my motiva motivations for the class, right? Regardless of what the class is. And try to think about how this is relevant to your life, your academic and your career goals. From there, if you follow the blue line, you'll see that you need to document that process. You need to share that process with others. You need to reflect on what people have said and what you've said to people about that process. Then you need to deliberate. Right? This means that you need to think about things critically and say, where am I going to go from here, like Ella Baker asked. And then finally, that's your chance now to act on that process. So ideally, you'd get here, right, to the end, right, where you're doing advocacy as a choice. That's your action. Okay, And this process is probably not linear. right? You'll go kind of all over the place, and maybe you'll go really quickly in some areas, and maybe you'll sidestep for a little while. Um, I hope you don't fall backwards, but you know that's always a process that could happen, and so you want to be aware of that. But most importantly, when we look at the model, we think about from the beginning, I have to consider my identity. So I have to reflect on what it is that I want to do in life, right? especially when it comes to civic change. And so this requires some form of documentation. Now, a lot of times this is writing something down, but it could also be verbal. It could be uh, artistic. You could make a drawing, right? Um, you could shoot a film, uh, you could take pictures. There's so many different ways of documenting your own identity and what your self-expression is. From here, you really can't do that in isolation in order to make civic change. And so you have to share that work. Um, this gives you a sense of awareness of not only what you're doing, but what other people are doing. And, and likely you'll start to find people who are very similar to you um, and may not be doing exactly the same thing. Maybe you're making a movie and they're making music. But you can start to see this as their way of self-expression, and in some ways it's similar to your own point of view. This then creates kind of a dialogue process. You know, Before that, you're kind of stuck in monologue, right? You're just thinking about things as one person. A dialogue requires two people, and that's where you have to share uh, what you're working on and what you think is important, and that's really where agency comes from. From there, you want to articulate what you are learning. And so that always requires reflection. You need to take a step back, think about it, put away your phone, put away the TV, right? Put away the internet and just spend some time, you know, walking, spend some time in a park, just thinking about how are things going? I often like to say process over content. So don't think so much about the end product as much as is the process a form of dialogue? Are you sharing your work with other people or are you in isolation? Um, you'll see that isolation creates a lot of quote unquote otherness or you know fear of other people. Whereas when you're engaged with other people, um, when you're critically reflecting about that process, that process of working with others, uh, it's very difficult to get into an isolated frame of mind. And then that kind of creates this process now where you've got a lot of different people giving lots of different points of view. And remember that's part of critical thinking. But that also helps you understand what's called understanding, right? So a general understanding that's more than just what's in your own mind or what's more than just your past experience. And most importantly, this allows you to have understanding with others. Um, when you deliberate, when you think about things with others, that's where change really starts to happen, right? Change doesn't really happen before that. You need to be able to be working with other people. And then finally, when you act, you can think of it as a choice, right? So you can advocate for yourself. You can advocate for people like you. You can advocate for people who don't have a voice. But you really can't do that until you go through this process. Um, sometimes you'll see people trying to advocate for other people without having an understanding with others and without having reflected on their own process. And this usually leads to tensions, fighting, and, and not really a whole lot of change. So then that brings me to the end, and, and this really is where theory and practice come together. Um, 
So I'll just share a brief story about myself. I was talking about this work, and and somebody had asked me, what could we do? And, and I didn't realize what they were asking was, what could I do specifically? Um, and so I, you know, I was very honest. I said I wasn't 100% sure. I was still trying to solve some of these problems, especially within my own community and people who are very angry and yelling and, and oftentimes violent. And the student responded um, not very aggressively. I mean, it was, it was very kind when they said this to me because we were in a dialogue, right? And so we were trying to understand each other. And they said, you're not exercising your own ag agency. You're hiding behind doubt and insecurity. And I thought about that. Um, I couldn't help but thinking about it for a period of time, uh, a couple of days. And I realized that the student was absolutely correct, that there was more that I could do. Um, so I kind of returned to my own way of thinking about teaching. And I wanted to be uh, an example uh, not just of theory, but also of practice. And so I, I have said previously in a, in a chapter that I wrote about um, in that same book that Deborah Schultz is in about civic engagement at the community college, I said, I think encouraging students to explore and make meaning of the humanities, and the humanities are English, uh, history, political science, law, criminal justice. It's kind of like social science is another uh, idea, but it also includes art, music, music. Um, this inspired the generative themes or um, a way of thinking about our social relations through these three ideas, which are difference, sometimes called diversity, democratic thinking, which is a process of thinking that is not authoritarian and almost always includes dialogue, and then community, which is a, a word that I want us to challenge more and more um, to be less about what we believe our identity is in our community and more about what is the community around us thinking about us and how can we contribute to that. But that these three ideas greatly increased the range of student work and released imagination I'd previously left untapped. And what I mean by that is instead of just focusing on say an essay or a slideshow, students started contributing like you saw. They started making cartoons, um, students started making poetry, uh, some students have engaged in music, some students make food. Um, this shows us that there's lots of ways about making meaning about democratic practice and civic engagement, and that there's not one definition. Um, and then I think we need to think about social justice or change or justice generally um, as this requirement of needing each other. You can't have justice or even liberty by yourself. Um, and so one way you might think about that is the way that the media or the popular media tends to portray individuals as opposed to groups. And so one interesting thing that we have at our disposal in this generation is something called interactive technology or you know a piece of technology, whether it's your phone, a computer, a video camera, a uh, pho photograph, um, there's so many technologies out there that allow us to not only create, but also to share with others and then get feedback on that. Um, and that these are must for democratic learning engagement. And what I mean by that is if you don't have interactive technology, you are not engaging in democratic practice because, right, we live in a social world and that social world is spread so much quicker and more um, practically, right, more people have access to even low levels of technology, such as um, a phone or even a radio, if you think about it that way, um, we can spread information so much quicker and talk to each other and create a dialogue in ways that we couldn't before, um, which really gets us out of isolation and into dialogue. And so two that I've began working on over the last few years um, with a number of students and with other people out in the community um, is to use Utah, YouTube not as a place for... Um, you know, other content, right? Like watching movies or um, music videos, but rather to create content with people that's almost similar to a news channel, right? So that we can create our own concepts that other people can comment on, that can watch and share with other people, especially when it relates to education. And here I mean like things that we all need to know, right? And so we've put things on there that have to do with immigration, um, environmental politics, uh, criminal justice system, the prison population, uh, parenting, relationships. Right? There's so many different ways that we can help other people think about these big, big, big concepts um, that's dialogical as opposed to just here's what I say. Um, and then also using SoundCloud and other podcast-based uh, mediums 
um, to provide a much richer experience, right? There's, you can do a lot through video, uh, but video takes a lot of work. Um, a podcast is pretty simple to put together. Um, you can make it as complicated as you want, of course, but it could just be as simple as downloading a voice recorder app on your phone uh, and then uploading that content. So this is something you could do pretty easily with three or four people in a room and just pass the phone around. And you could have your own kind of variety or, or social justice or news current events show um, where you could give your own perspective and really talk about what's going on in your community. Um, as well as what's going on in the college campus. So I would encourage you, obviously, again, we need each other for change. So I, we need people to subscribe and propose content for YouTube and SoundCloud. But this is really a way for you to get involved in the practice of theory. So if you believe in change, if you want to see change, um, like the students said, we can't hide behind doubt and insecurity. We have to exercise our own agency. So in this short video, I just wanted to give you an example of uh, three people really, I think, who do a great job of this, which is uh, Ella Baker and Dottie Miller Zellner, who were you know, totally at the other ends of the age uh, spectrum, right? Ella Baker was um, in her 50s and Dottie Zellner was in her 20s. And yet they were able to work together to make change using the skills and the talents that they had to cooperate with each other in a dialogue for change. Um, and the third person, I think, is Deborah Schultz, a professor here at Kingsborough, who's able to capture the story and is a brilliant writer. And, you know, you should really consider picking up this book. Um, it's, got, it's a very complicated book. It gives a lot of different points of view, um, but it provides a framework for both identity and agency, the ability to make change.